What is friendship? Is it simply a matter of the likeness or differences in between individuals? Is it simply a matter of getting away from the evil for the sake of the good? All of this and more. This is Plato's Lysis. We're going to get right into the story here in a moment, but first a quick preface. The Greek word used for friendship in this context is philia, which means something a little bit more than friendship, uh, less of a modern term, less of a modern connotation, more of a village people's YMCA background story. Anywho, uh, the setup begins with uh, Socrates wanting to go to the Lyceum straight from the academy, but he runs into Hippo Hippo Hippothales and Ctesippus, and they convince him to come to the newly built palaestra, which is like a wrestling school, outside the walls of Athens with the lure of conversation. And to Socrates, this is quite a lure, because he, uh, he just immediately decides to abandon all of his plans that he had before and go and converse. Um, and while he's doing this, he, he encounters them and he's like, okay, in order to conduct myself properly before the best amongst you, I need to know who the best amongst you is. So who is the favorite? Who is, who is the people's favorite in this area? And Hippolytes goes, well, some have one favorite, others another. And then, uh, and then Socrates asks him, who is your favorite? And Hippolytes, like, he, he has a nervous reaction to this, blushes, and uh, Ctesippus, Ctesippus sort of, like, makes fun of him for this, and then Socrates is like, okay, who is it? I may not know much, but I know, I know the matters, that, I, I know these sorts of matters. I know that you're definitely in love with someone. Um, and, he, and then Hippothales just blushes even more, and Ctesippus at this point makes fun of him even more, and at this point he says... Well, well, hi, hi, so, something along the lines of hip, Hippothales, it's, it's astounding to see that you're so hesitant to reveal the name of this person, when in a few moments you would be singing his praises to Socrates, just as you did with us a few moments ago, and quite li loudly, if I may add. Um, and then Socrates rebukes him for this, and then he says, he, he, he says something along the lines of, uh, uh, of, wow, Hippothales, you're so incredibly foolish. <laughs> you, you just... Because if, if you don't get him, you would have wasted all of that, all of that, all of that singing on somebody that you're never going to have, um, and 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 from and from there, like uh, I realize this, Socrates, and, but but from there, like uh, Hippolytes actually humbles himself, and then he he says like, okay, I realize this, but I would ask you to show me what is what is the the proper action so that i may become endearing to my love and uh, socrates says this this go, socrates goes this won't be easy but i'll try if you can get him over here and uh, hippothales is like okay yeah we we can probably get him over here because the uh conversation he he really likes conversation as well he likes interesting topics such as such as the ones that you usually talk about socrates so you and satisipus go over there and you start talking and eventually you'll get his attention that and his friend menexenus is who is also a friend of satisipus and so with the lure of menexenus and the lure of conversation eventually lysis will go and seat next to you guys and this happens and and there's this really funny part though that that happens while that's happening hippothales goes and he hides behind a crowd i know it's it's kind of goodness no 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 pride hippothales hippothales has no pride but um but i mean i mean he did to be fair to be fair socrates did say watch me and and, and try to, to try to come up with your own way through watching me that sort of thing but uh getting on to the second part of this this setup socrates and notices that Menexen is set, and then Lysis, Ly Lysis follows, and then sits next to him, and they're sitting side by side. And this is actually a little bit more important than it appears to be on the surface, for a reason that I'll discuss later on. Um, Socrates begins asking Menexenus if out of the two of them, which, and this is where the dialogue gets kind of gets kind of weird, but again, we'll we'll see why here in a moment. Socrates begins asking Menexenus if out of the two of them, which was elder, nobler, fairer. They, uh, they laugh at all this. Uh, I, I imagine it sort of being like a nervous chuckle, like old man coming up to you asking these questions. You know, it's kind of weird. Um, but Socrates m remarks that it would be no use in asking which of the two is richer because they, being friends, must have all things in common. They assent to this. 
So here's, here's the little explanation for what's going on here. He's trying to get at the notion of friendship here. He sees these two people, um, they're, they're, he sees these two people being, being friends, and he's like, oh, you two young people already know, already, already capable of having friendship. You must know what friendship is, though I, in fact, do not. And Socrates was uh, about to question them further about which of them was just or which of them was wiser, but Menexenus is called on by a gymnastic master and he has to go away. He turns to Lysis then and he says, Lysis, I know your parents must love you, but why do you think they prohibit you from doing some things that slaves would do, like driving a chariot um, while allowing you to do other things? And Lysis, Lysis here says, it's because I, I'm not at the age to do so. And, and, and here it gets like sort of weird because it's, it's, if, you didn't, if you didn't realize the, the line of questioning here, it's like, wow, Socrates, you're a stranger and you're asking people these questions. And that's kind of, eh, I don't know about that. But, <laughs> but anyways, it, it gets to where he's, he, he, he says, you think it's age, but I think it's actually wisdom. It's like, wouldn't the prince of Asia allow for a young man, a young man who is a better cook than his eldest son to be his cook rather than his own son. What if, what if he needs somebody to check the condition of his eyes? Wouldn't the, wouldn't the man with medicinal knowledge of such matters be trusted with dealing with that uh, issue more than his eldest son would? Despite, despite the fact that the person doing it and the person with that expertise would be of a younger age? And it's like, yeah. Um, and and here, here what's pretty interesting is we get like sort of uh, an early... An early, uh, an early route to the idea of rights implying responsibilities, and uh, that's that's pretty interesting. And we'll see that really pop up much later on in, in the later dialogues. But for now, let's go into sort of like Socrates's in, uh, Socrates's explanation of why people seem to uh, one of the surface reasons of why people tend to gather a whole bunch of friends. Um, he says. Then now, my dear Lysis, I said, you perceive that in things which we know, everyone will trust us, Hellenes and barbarians, men and women, and we may do as we please about them, and no one will like to interfere with us. We shall be free and masters of others, and these things will be really ours, for we shall be benefited by them. But in things of which we have no understanding, no one will trust us to do as seems good to us. They will hinder us as far as they can, and not only strangers, but father and mother, and the friend, if there be one who is dearer still, will also hinder us, and we shall be subject to others, and these things will not be ours, for we shall not be benefited by them. Do you agree? And he assents to this. And then he goes on, and shall we be friends to others, and will any others love us, in so far as we are useless to them? No. And therefore, my boy, if you are wise, all men will be your friends and kindred, for you will be useful and good. But if you are not wise, neither father nor mother, nor kindred nor anyone else will be your friends. And in matters of which you have as yet no knowledge, can you have any conceit, that is, pride for yourself, of knowledge? And you, Lysis, if you require a teacher, have not yet attained wisdom, and therefore you are not conceited, having nothing of which to be conceited. And... This is sort of like another, another sort of like early route into things that will be expressed later. Socrates oftentimes says in the later dialogues, if, if anybody has read like the Republic or, or Phaedo or, Par, or uh, Protagoras or Cratylus, those dialogues, he says he's always saying something along the lines of God only is wise and I know nothing. Well, here we see the reason why, because... In order to, in order for him to, in order for him to say that, he has to be, he has to be willing to have knowledge enough to convince himself that that he can be conceited of that knowledge. But he doesn't, and he never does, because he realizes. I think that's because he realizes that out of all that there is to know, he knows nothing. That and the fact that these perfect forms are beyond him, and we'll sort of get into that later again. But um, anywho, moving on with the rest of the story, Socrates is about to tell Hippotha. Hippothales, that's how it, that's how it's that's how it's supposed to be done. You're supposed to humble the the person rather than building them up before you get them. Um, but he looks at Hippothales, and Hippothales is excited, and he's confused, and he's paying attention, which means that Hippothales really does care, and that he doesn't actually need the rebuke. And so Socrates is like, oh, okay, I, I I'll leave him alone then, because to do so would be embarrassing, and I don't want to do that. And then. 
And then just as he makes this decision, Menexenus shows up and, Lys and, and Lysis, um, and this is a thing really typical, like it, it, and it goes to show that human nature, man, human nature hardly changed, because Lysis whispers in, in Socrates' ear that he wants him to argue with him on these issues so that he can lay him low too. It's, Lysis isn't thinking like, oh wow, Socrates, that's profound. He's thinking, oh man, my pride is gone. Lower that guy's pride too. Destroy Menexenus, right? Um, but Socrates, he's, he's very humble, and so he says something along the lines of, I'm too scared to do so, because Menexenus is great friends with Cetesiphus, and Cetesiphus is a, pay, is a payant, payanist, payanist? I hope I'm saying that right. Not a pianist, a payanist. <laughs> Keep that in mind. A payanist, if I'm saying that right, in, 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 in Old Greek was, uh, was a, a person who made speeches and loud praises of glory for, like, the gods and stuff within their mythology and just things in general. Um... But he eventually, he eventually gives in and starts to, and he starts to question Menexenus. Before he does, though, he explains why he's been pursuing the essence of friendship. And he does so by saying, But first I must tell you that I am one who from my childhood upward has set my heart upon a certain thing. All people have their fancies. Some desire horses and other dogs. Some are fond of gold and others of honor. Now, I have no violent desire of any of these things, but I have a passion for friends. I would rather have a good friend than the best cock or quail in the world. I would even further and say the best horse or dog. Yeah, by the dog of Egypt, I should greatly prefer a real friend to all the gold of Darius, or even Dar Darius himself. I am such a lover of friends as that, and when I see you and Lysus at your early age, so easily possessed of this treasure, and so soon, he of you and you of him, I am amazed and delighted, seeing that I myself, although I am now advanced in years, am so far from having made a similar acquisition, that I do not even know in what way a friend is, in, is acquired. So what makes a friendship? And here we'll get into, into the, the main questions of the dialogue. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor. Are you in need of a podcasting app for all your podcasting dreams? Anchor is an all-in-one platform where you can create, distribute, and monetize your podcast from any device for free. With easy-to-use creation tools, record or upload and edit from any device with tools designed to make you sound great, regardless of your skill level. With 100% free hosting and distribution, no storage limits, no trial period, no catch. Automatically distributed to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and all other major listening platforms. For more information and to sign up, visit anchor.fm. That's A-N-C-H-O-R dot F-M. Anchor, the easiest way to make a podcast. So leaving off from where we previously were, we get into a we get into a bit a bit of a kerfuffle about whether the lover or the beloved is the friend or may either be the friend. And this starts with this is like the first question that he that he throws at Menexenus. He's like, okay, so is the lover or the beloved the friend or may either be the friend or may and and Menexenus says either may be the friend. However. As, as they, the, the problem that Socrates runs into and the problem that, that they all run into is that you can't have a friend without friendship. And this must be a, a mutual, uh, this must be a, a mutual dealing because uh, in, in, in wrestling with the question of whether the lover is the friend of the beloved, whether, uh, and whether he be loved in return or hated or the beloved is the friend of the lover, we realize that you can't really make the case that if someone loves another and they are not loved back, then there is a friendship there, right? Um, and I guess one could get into the, the matter of perception in regard to either and throughout time and say that what appeared to be may not be the case upon later reflection, but this isn't a question of what appears to be. And like most, uh, most things within Plato, it's about what it actually is in the unchanging state of still. And with that in mind, we encounter the paradox of a man being an enemy to his friend or a friend to his enemy, in the case in which one hates the other. And this gets back to the, that platonic mode of thought. It's about examining the situation as a whole and realizing that taking a subjective claim as equivalent to absolute truth inevitably leads into paradoxes. And in, and in this case, one on the nature of friendship, the subjective perspectives create a paradox when considered as absolute truth. And with that, we're left with the fact that one person doesn't make a friendship. 
After this, Socrates tries to go about it from a different angle. He gives, like, Menexenus a break, because it's understandable, right? Menexenus goes through this stuff, uh, like, and it's like, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't need a break after questioning with Socrates? But anyways, um, he gets into consulting the poets, and he asks, if those who say God is ever drawing like towards like and making them acquainted are right, um, and, and, and this is basically asking the question of, um, does the likeness of two people make a friendship? At first, Lysis is like, maybe, because he, because, because he, because I mean, like, who wouldn't just say maybe here rather than yes? Um, but they figure out that the statement is only half true because the injured and the, the injured and the injurer can't really be friends. And in the case of the bad, this is exactly the case. And when I say the bad, I mean purely the bad. If bad were friend with bad, then, then neither would come out of the relationship unscathed by the other. Things at variance with one another are not, are not in a union with one another. And he, he makes that point quite clear. Um, but it's like, a, and, and then they, they move on to the, to the other half of why this, 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 uh, this way of saying that it's purely likeness that leads to friendship is also wrong because they then realize that the entire statement is false in the case of the good because the, because uh, in the case of a friendship, it takes, it takes somebody to be, it takes somebody to have a, a, a certain desire for that friendship. And in order to have that desire, you have to be in want. But the good is never in want because the good is always self-fulfilled. Um, and so, and so we're left off with the, it certainly isn't the case that, that likeness doesn't make friendship. Okay. Okay. So it's not likeness. Um, so how about the opposite? How about and, and what I mean by the opposite is literally the, 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 the differences in between the differences in between us making making people friend making us friends, um, and uh, and then Menexenus comes back and he says that on first view that's right and you can tell like Menexenus hasn't really learned his lesson here, uh, unlike Lysis and then uh, and then he goes and and then they, they go along like a trail of thought which eventually leads to this definition being undermined again. Um, Socrates poses the question of whether or not it makes sense that the enemy is the friend of the friend or the friend the friend of the enemy. And so it's just like on pure logical grounds it falls apart because if, 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 it's, just, if it's just opposites attract, it's like the friend and the enemy are opposites. So now you have to deal with that. And so that, that argument just falls to pieces. And, uh, and, and, and one of the things I noticed is like this was like the fastest one to get rid of. I was like, that was fast. And one that my... And, 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 and just before we get into the other one, it's, it's important that I note that one might notice the extremes taken towards these definitions and wonder about um, those things which are neither good or bad, or, or the, the good or the bad. And, and we get into that with the next definition. And that's, and that's like, uh, and, and that's like a friendship is a, is a thing existing, um, existing, existing for the sake of the good to get away from the evil. So, Re basically, it's a question of, does evil cause friendship? And this, this leads us to what I see as the, the most profound part of this dialogue, because Socrates proceeds to try and see if it's the case that what is neither good nor evil is the friend of the beautiful and the good. Because just as the diseased body, a body being neither good or evil, is the friend of the cure, regarded as, as the good here, for fear of the disease deemed as evil, so too do those who are within the presence of evil seek the good out as friend and protector, and does the good, and, and, and so does the good to eliminate the bad. Um, Socrates at first, he's like, he's, he's very optimistic about this. He's, he's rejoicing at the fact that he finally found the essence of friendship. But then he reels in horror as the definition crumbles before his very mind. Because uh, for that which is only loved for the sake of something else is not loved for what it is, but what one wishes to gain. Um, that is to say that he, he points out that the, the truly dear or ulti ultimate principle of friendship is not for the sake of any further object. It's self-fulfilling. You want it for the sake of itself. And, uh, and, and, and furthermore, this means that if evil perishes, there will be no need of good and no need of the friendship between good and neutral because there, would, because there in this line of questioning is no use in good for its own sake. Because remember, at the start, like what, what, what gets people a whole bunch of friends? The fact that they're useful and good. And it's like here in this moment, good isn't useful. And so it's like it, it, it falls apart because there's no use in good because 
in, in this line of questioning, g there's no use in good for its own sake. Um, and, and Socrates completes this with a rem by remarking that, then the final principle of friendship, in which all other friendships terminated, those I mean which are relatively dear and for the sake of something else, is of another, and a different nature from them. For they are called dear because of another dear, or friend. But with the true friend, or dear, the case is quite the reverse, for that is proved to be dear because of the hated. And if the hated were away, it would be no longer dear. But oh, will you tell me, I said, whether if evil were to perish, we should hunger any more, or thirst any more, or have any similar desire? Or may we suppose that hunger will remain while men and animals remain, but not so as to be hurtful, and, if, and, the, the, and the same of thirst and other desires, that they will remain, but will not be evil because evil has perished? Or rather, shall I say, that to ask what either will be, then, or will not be, is ridiculous. For who knows? This we do know, that in our present condition, hunger may injure us, and may also benefit us. Is that not true? Um, what's interesting is that this uh, is, and, and, and we'll get into uh, here in a bit, is that the argument isn't completely dismissed as the other ones are, but, but Socrates moves on here, and Socrates then goes on to say that if evil perishes, there is, there's no reason why that which is not evil should perish with it. And, 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 and that which is neither good or evil will remain, and of these, desire exists. So, so is, is desire perhaps the cause of friendship? And this gets into the, and this is actually the, the start of uh, another inquiry into another, and yet another definition. However, they run into another obstacle here, and that's that desire comes when we are, we are in want. And Socrates, uh, Socrates points out that this must mean that a congenial nature is what must have friendship, and they are unable to separate congenial from the like, and wind back up in the likeness argument. And, and if not for that, they'd say congenial is is good, uncongenial is bad, and in which case they wind up in the one just before this. And so it, it gets into, it would, it would just be a circular, a circular, uh, a long, winding road that leads to nothing. Um, and, and so from, from there we get to like the ending, and, and, it's, and it's, 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 a, it's a good thing to point out here that Lysis, um, Lysis, before the state of this argument, was silent, because he was like, because he, he's lost all confidence in, 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 in the idea that they could come up with a definition. Uh, and, and, and Hippothales, by the end of this dialogue, is like he's looking on with quite a, a happy, expressive attitude because he sees what is what, what, the way in which to treat Lysis for some reason. I guess that's how, that's how it's going to go because humbling, humbling the, the, the beloved or, or whatever. Um, and, and, the, and the dialogue ends with Socrates at a loss of word and words and Lysis and Menexenus are taken home by tutors. Um, and, and, but this, this, the, this final part and the way that it really ends is Socrates cries out to them saying that they and the whole world watching would say that they are friends without being able to discover what friendship is and what makes a friend. And here we get into something quite central and why epistemology or, or knowing how we know what we know is central to platonic thought. And that's the idea that we act out what we believe without fully knowing what we believe. You act that you believe in friendship, but you can't define it. And, and here uh, we get, and, and, from, from, and, that, and that's how the dialogue ends. But going from there, we're going into the synopsis here. And um, this, uh, this is really what's interesting to me. Um, and what's interesting to me is that the fourth argument still has some sway behind it, or rather, and, and, and that's because like of that line that, or rather shall I say, that to ask what either will be then or will not be is ridiculous for who knows. Um, and, and, that, uh, and, and the other line, that no reason why that which is not evil should perish with it. And isn't in, and, and in dealing with the, the first part, evil, evil still existing for all time, isn't it the case that when one sees the forces of entropy and, 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 and that is to say chaos that permeates throughout our being and all without, he realize, doesn't, doesn't that person realize that, that we together, you and I, are all we've got to face it? Isn't that something which leads to the very Christian idea that we should see God in the face of every man? However, is that only because of the entropy? And that goes into the second idea. Perhaps there's something more to that. Perhaps it's possible that one can be the friend of the good for the sake of the good. Or, or does it even matter? And these are questions that Plato leaves us with at the end of Lysis. 
And I think that's it for now. So thank you so much for your time, and have a good one. This has been Classics with Congress. <laughs>